everybody, come on in, find your places. Let's get things started. <laughs> Turn to page number 59, at Calvary. I mean, burdens are lifted at Calvary. That's what I meant. <laughs> 59, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Uh, a little hot here tonight, Talon. I tell Talon, I need to turn me up, man. I need, that's too much, Talon. Turn me down, turn me down. All right, number 59. All three verses, burdens are lifted at Calvary. <clears throat> number 5, 9. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heartache and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Wonderful singing today. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for our church family and uh, the services that we have each and every week. Someone said we're very busy, and I'm thankful to be busy in your work and in your service. We pray your blessing on the service tonight. Bless your people. Thank you for them taking time out to be in your house. Worked hard all day long. Many things going on. Some haven't even had supper yet, but they're here, and we thank you for that. Uh, give us a blessing tonight. Help us to grow. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Who didn't get a prayer bulletin tonight? Raise your hand. We'll get one to you. If you need a prayer bulletin, we'll get one to you. All right, looks like we're well covered. We announced it last week. We're doing our prayer requests a little bit different now. We're asking you to text them to Shannon Stiff sometime during the week. And then we'll read you the requests that have come in and then we'll pray. This is going to help uh, keep the uh, time down in our services so that we can get you out of here reasonably. I always blamed it on the prayer requests. Now we're going to find out if I was right or not. So here are the new requests. <clears throat> Matt Wilkins, that's my cousin, Gary and Maeve Wilkin. Uh, you know Pastor Gary Wilkins from Maine. Uh, Matt has diabetes. He's losing vision. His blood sugar's at 300, and they're going to be giving him eye injections. Uh, so pray for him. They're very expensive injections. They do not know how many he's going to need. Uh, so be in prayer for Matt, would you please? Then Ron Markley has a very serious unspoken request. And then uh, pray for the carpeting job in the basement. We have uh, had our stewardship program, you know, to try to raise money with the young people to get the carpeting job done. And they got about a third of it, maybe a little less than that accomplished. And we've been spending stewardship money in other places as well. Uh, but we're trying to see about getting that wrapped up here. So pray about that. 
And then pray for Johnny Sharber. He had a heart attack yesterday, just a man in his 40s. So pray for him, all right? Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer about these. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for hearing our prayers as we've been teaching and preaching all uh, this month so far on prayer in Sunday school and in the morning services. We're a grateful people and uh, I hope you see the effort we're making to be a praying people as well. We bring to you these needs tonight, Matt Wilkins and this uh, issue with diabetes, losing his eyesight over it, very high numbers and needing injections to help uh, save his vision that are quite costly. Lord, would you please uh, work in his body, help him with his health. Uh, he's not a man who is uh, severely overweight or anything like that. He's healthy and fit, uh, but still diabetic. We pray that you'll uh, help him to have the funds necessary to take care of the eye issue and uh, to help get this back in check. We pray for Ron tonight in this very serious unspoken need that he has. I know that Ron often asks for unspoken prayer uh, every week and here now one particular burden that he really needs your attention and help with. Father, would you please answer his prayer? We pray that you'd do so speedily. Whatever this need is, Lord, it means much to him. And we know that he means much to you, so we ask that you'd please uh, bless and answer for his sake. Any of the others in the room tonight that have unspoken requests, we know many of them usually do, and we just pray for all of those unspoken needs tonight as well. Then we pray for our carpeting in the basement. We'd like to see uh, finished. We pray that you'll help stretch those stewardship funds as well as uh, find ways to uh, increase otherwise in order to finish that job. It's a much more expensive job than might seem at first. And so please provide for that need. Then we pray for Johnny Sharber, this man with the heart attack yesterday. Be with him, please help him to recover from it well. Uh, Lord, just a young man here, we pray for his family. Be with those who love him, comfort their hearts. And we pray that anything that might need to be tended to, such as stints or a change in diet or something of that nature that could help prevent this again in the future, Lord, would you please allow that to occur for him. We love you, Father, and we're thankful to be able to pray. We ask all of these things of you tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, tuck those requests aside. They are in your bulletins uh, unless they came in a little bit later. I will tell you this, uh, what Shannon's going to do is accept them up until noon and then she'll be on Wednesdays, then she'll be printing off the prayer bulletins uh, so that we can have them ready for the night. So if you get it in by noon on Wednesday, it'll be in the bulletin that week. If you don't get, if you get it in afternoon, then it'll be in next week's bulletin, although she'll still be able to get it to me. All right, Isaiah and Malachi, you guys want to help pass out candy here tonight? Come get your baskets. Our quiz tonight is in the book of Psalms, Psalms 126 through 150. 126 to 150. The first one will be in 126. Are we ready? Book of Psalms, 126. Away we go. Number one. What occurred that caused the heathen to believe that God had done something great? What occurred that caused the heathen to believe that God had done something great? Eva. That's correct. Laughter and singing made them think that God had done something great. <clears throat> Was that your answer also, Shannon Stiff? Yeah. You guys were so close. In fact, you both raised your arms rather slowly, which was sort of comical, but Eva beat you just by a hair. All right, next, number two. What do they that sow in tears, Brent? They reap in joy. That is correct. Then, number three. What is it we are to bear forth? Winston. 
Bear what? That is correct. Precious seed. What will the results be? Sharon Stiff. Very good. Very good. 127. Who must build the house? Terry. That's correct. The Lord must build the house. Who preached on that recently? Oh, Shannon Stiff. Oh, Nicole Stiff. Brother Gray. Bob Gray preached on that recently. I mean, you had the odds in your favor there, Shannon Stiff. And that's exactly why we don't gamble, Rick. <laughs> All right. What three things are vain? Let's break that up. Just one at a time. Russ? To sit up late. To sit up late. Nicole? To rise up early. Brent? Eat the bread of sorrows. So that's Russ Cronk, Nicole Stiff, Brent Dix. What does the Lord give his beloved? Ashton, sleep. That means if you suffer from insomnia, the Lord doesn't love you. I'm just kidding. You should see the looks I get sometimes. What do you want, Terry? The question's already been answered. I thought I was. 127. Yeah, 127. All right. What are in heritage of the Lord? Rick. Children. Children. That is correct. 133. Jump to 133. How should brethren dwell together? Winston. In unity. That is correct. 135. How are idols like the people that make and worship them? Nicole. Brent. And one more. They have mouths, but do not speak. Ears, but they do not hear. Donna Wildman? Eyes? That's correct. Eyes, but they see not. Yeah. All right, Psalm 130. Did you get your candy, though? You did get a correct. You gave two of the three correct answers, so that counts. All right. Psalm 136. What is the... Key phrase, Rick. For his, mercy for his mercy endureth forever. 136. How many times is that phrase used in the psalm? Vicki. That is correct. Did you write it down? No. Your notes. Oh, look at you. The art of deduction. All right. 139. In what two ways is man made? Should we break these up? Winston? It is. That is correct. He didn't break them up. I guess that's his way of saying, no, we shouldn't break them up. <laughs> what is greater than the sand? Nicole. God's thoughts toward us, that is correct. I'm, I'm preparing a sermon, Rick, on Psalm 139 called God Loves You. I know that you, you know that I don't preach the, the truth in love as much, so I'm working hard at it. Ah, 150. What should everything that has breath do? Rick? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That is right. Uh, the Psalms from... 125 to about 140. Do you know what those psalms are called? You won't get it from the text. You might have headers or notes that tell you. Ma. Yes, psalms of degrees. Does anyone know what that means? 
There's another name for it. Can you give me the other name for it? Psalms of degrees or Psalms of what? Praise. Not praise. Good guess, Rick. No one knows? Psalms of ascension. Have you heard of that? Okay, why are they called Psalms of degrees or Psalms of ascension? No one knows? Mother. That's correct, yes. They, the two things, uh, Jerusalem is a city set on a hill, and so as they ascended to Jerusalem, they would, they would sing the different psalms as they ascended. Then once they got to the temple, as they would ascend the temple steps, they would also sing or recite the psalms. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I did all 150 psalms on our online devotion last year. Gentlemen, you may take four pieces of candy and then put your buckets back on the table, please. All right. Men, could I have some ushers, please? Let's do this. Give every one of those, please, Rick, and then Brent, every one of those, please. So I'm passing out the sheet of those 16 missing verses from modern English translations. Dan asked for them a week or two ago, and so I went ahead and, and got them and printed them all out for you. Now I will say I stole these from another source, so I, don't, I didn't double check any of them. For the record, I don't even have a modern English translation of the Bible in my office. Uh, I suppose I could have looked online, but I just didn't have the time to check every verse, but uh, those are, I, I found that on a, from a specific source, and uh, so if you have one, you might compare and check, and uh, so there you have that. The other sheet that's being passed out is tonight's note sheet for our series on Calvinism, or hyper-Calvinism, whichever way you want to title it. We call it hyper-Calvinism for those who may misunderstand the words given in the tulip acrostic, because some of them sound like something we might agree with, uh, total depravity of man. If I said to you, do you believe the total depravity of man? You'd probably say, yeah, I do. I believe man is totally depraved, but you don't mean it like they mean it, right? Thank you, sir. Oh, okay. So hyper-Calvinism def defines it also, thank you, sir, also just Calvinism defines it. All right, let's pray together, please. Father, help us as we uh, undergo the study of this heresy that spreads so easily. Uh, it's an attack on witnessing and winning people to Jesus Christ. With this truth or this doctrine, I should say, in place, it's not true it's false, it's error, it's heresy. There's no responsibility for us to spread the gospel whatsoever. I pray that we'd see clearly from the scripture tonight how it's erroneous. Bless our time and our study. Give us the mind of Christ. Fill me with the power of your spirit as you fill your people also, please. In Christ's name we ask, amen. All right, I'll try to keep uh, following along so that you can, uh, I can make sure your bl blanks are getting filled in. So let's quickly review last week. We said that John Calvin was a former Catholic who left the Roman Catholic Church during the time of the Protestant Reformation when Martin Luther discovered Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When we finish this series, I'm going to teach you one week on how Catholics believe you get to heaven. And it's going to blow your mind when you see what a Roman Catholic believes is necessary to get to heaven. It's a wonder any of them ever make it if that's the way that it were to come about. Uh, and so you'll see clearly how Luther discovering Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 would absolutely revolutionize everything that he believes. Roman Catholics are a straight, 
works salvation theology. And salvation is not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy hath he saved us. And so Martin Luther leaves the Roman Catholic Church, starts the Lutheran denomination. John Calvin is a former Catholic who left during the Protestant Reformation. We also took time to make sure it's understood that um, we know Baptists are not Protestants. We were never a part of the Roman Catholic Church. We are part of the original church. Uh, that I mean, John the Methodist, right? No, John the Baptist. Uh, we go all the way back to the time of Christ. We never did get askew doctrinally. So, total depravity. Calvinists believe that man is so totally depraved that he cannot choose to respond to God's convicting power or his gospel message. In fact, a Calvinist will tell you that for a man to be able to say yes makes that a work salvation. That's just ridiculous to go to that point. It's not ridiculous to say yes. You know, if, if you drove up to the uh, church in a 2022 yellow convertible Corvette, and said, Pastor, I bought you this Corvette. Uh, would you like it? And you handed me the keys. And I said, yes, and snatched them before you could change your mind. Would I be working for that car? No, I just accepted it. You did all of the work, or you're about to, as you make those payments for the next 30 years, right? Uh, and so, no, that's not, it's just saying yes is not works, but they ascribe works to it. Now, the Bible does teach man is depraved and sinful in nature. That is without debate. But it also teaches that man has a choice in receiving Christ and is not so depraved that he cannot say yes. One of the key verses we brought out last week was John chapter 5 and verse 40. And ye will not come unto me that ye might have life. If man didn't have the ability to say yes or no, Jesus wouldn't have said, ye will not come. He would have said, ye cannot come. And so there. We are now at the letter U. So T-U-L-I-P in this tulip acrostic. T stands for total, de excuse me, total depravity of man. The U in tulip uh, stands for unconditional election. Unconditional election election. Election just like a presidential election. TULIP stands, the U stands for unconditional election. Now what is unconditional election? By unconditional election, John Calvin meant that some are elected to heaven while others are elected to hell and that this election is unconditional. Some are elected to heaven, while some are, others are elected to hell, and that this condition, the, this election is unconditional. Let me say it one more time so you, I get it right this time. Calvin meant that some are elected to heaven, while others are elected to hell, and that this election is unconditional, and that man has no choice in the matter. So we do not say yes to Christ. We do not say no to Christ. God says yes or no for us. So what it means, and we mentioned it last week, we went through this side of the room. God says, you go to heaven, you go to heaven, you go to heaven, you go to heaven, you go to heaven. I hate doing this because I never want to send anybody to hell. But I now I'm at Dan, so Dan, you're on your way to hell. Uh, <laughs> and that God just chooses who he wants saved and who he wants lost. Isn't that a terrible thing to imagine? And that, that, God, that we have no say in the matter whatsoever. So, God from the foundation of the world has decided some will go to heaven and some will go to hell. And he didn't just decide randomly that some will and some won't. God chose himself who he would send to heaven and who he would send to hell. <clears throat> it is not 
a whim of God where he decides to save some, draw some men to him, and force other men to hell. That does not happen. But let's look at the Calvinist position. Number one, the Calvinist position. That's your next blank. Roman numeral one, the Calvinist position. What does the Calvinist believe about unconditional election? They believe, A, <clears throat> that God is sovereign. S-O-V-E-R-E-I-G-N. God is sovereign. S-O-V-E-R-E-I-G-N. And so must always attain what he desires. God is sovereign and so must always attain what he desires. Here's a quote from John Calvin himself in his book, Institutes of the Christian Religion, volume 2, page 206. By predestination, we mean the eternal decree of God by which he determined with himself whatever he wished to happen with regard to every man. All are not created on equal terms, but some are preordained to eternal life, others to eternal damnation. And accordingly, as each has been created for one or the other of these ends, we say that he has been predestinated to life or death. I didn't have to put any words in his mouth at all, did I? He spells it right out as clear as you can imagine. So the Bible speaks of predestination, and that's the, the doctrine he's talking about here. So what does predestination mean? Well, the prefix pre means before, and destination means uh, the destiny or arrival point or, or end result of, correct? So God has decided in his omniscience, and foreknowledge, and I know I'm throwing a lot of terms at you that we're going to define as we go along, uh, certain outcomes. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that God has taken from man his free will in knowing what those outcomes will be. And we're going to get to that as we work our way through. Now, the problem with John Calvin's position here and the statement that he just said is that God is not a respecter of persons. Tell me, church, does your Bible tell you that God is not a respecter of persons? Yes, it does. So if God then handpicked who would go to heaven and who would go to hell, would God be a respecter of persons? If he handpicked them, he would. Here, Acts chapter 10, verse 34. So the gospel has not been preached widely to the Gentiles yet at the time of Acts chapter 10, okay? Mostly to the, the Jews and the Greeks. Remember when the Gentile woman came to Jesus and he said, uh, what have I to do with thee? And, uh, and he called her a dog. That's harsh language, isn't it? We don't even like to read that story or talk about it. So what is he doing? He's telling this Gentile that he didn't come for the Gentiles in terms of his earthly ministry. And that is true. Jesus came to the house of Israel, the house of Jacob. But part of God's plan was that the gospel would eventually be preached to the Gentile, to all nations. The book of Isaiah teaches that. So the Jews rejected God the Father in the Old Testament. They rejected God the Son in the Gospels and crucified him at the end of those. They rejected God the Holy Spirit when they stoned Stephen in Acts chapter number 7. The Holy Spirit filled Stephen as he preached that message and the power of God came and convicted the hearts of those people and those Jews, instead of responding to the gospel with acceptance, they stoned the messenger to death. And God said, okay, I gave you Jews a chance. I dealt with you for thousands of years as, as the father. My son came and spent 33 years living amongst you, three years of which he performed every miracle possible to get you to understand that he was the son of God and the Messiah. 
and you, you crucified him. Now the Holy Spirit has come in power in Acts chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, everywhere you look. And now this deacon gets up and preaches this scathing sermon that should convict you to your core. And instead of submitting, you, you stone him to death. Gentiles, it's your turn. You get to hear the gospel now. And so a man named Cornelius is known for his devout prayer life and his almsgiving, meaning he helped the poor by giving to them generously. And he wakes Peter up and he says, Peter, I want you to go and preach to this man named Cornelius. He has this dream about eating non-kosher food. And Peter said, Lord, I've never eaten anything that's not kosher. And uh, he says, Peter, don't call thou common what I have called clean. So Peter eats uh, and then he goes to Cornelius' house, and the Jews weren't to associate with Gentiles. They weren't to go into their houses. They weren't to interact with them. They were to remain separate from them. So Peter goes in there, and he preaches. And then when Peter gets done, some other Jews say, we heard you were in a Gentile's house. And he said, i got to explain to you what happened. And so in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. And in this context, it's regarding salvation. God is no respecter of persons regarding salvation. But unconditional election teaches that he is. Letter B. God's foreknowledge means that he has predetermined every outcome. Now, this is the Calvinist position. This isn't truth, okay? Make sure you don't get your wires crossed here. We said, A, God is sovereign, so must always attain what he desires. That's a Calvinist position. First off, does God obtain everything that he desires? No, he doesn't. How about this? Uh, Israel, I don't want you to have a king now. I want you to wait. And Israel says, no, we want a king now. Did God get what he desired? No, he gave them the king. Uh, he wanted the people to cross over Jordan in the first generation. Did he get that? No. Hey, what did God want you today do? To, what did God want you to do today that you didn't give Him? Hmm? Are we all guilty of that? Yeah. And the ones who say no are well, we lied, didn't we? So yeah, God, God often, frequently does not get what He desires in spite of His sovereignty. Letter B, God's foreknowledge means that he has predetermined every outcome. So no, this is a false statement. This is Lewis Sperry Schaefer in Systematic Theology, Volume 1, page 159. That's in case you want to go hunt it down yourself. According to the scriptural conception, God foreknows because he has foreordained all things. And because in his providence... He will certainly bring all to pass. His foreknowledge is not a dependent one, which just waits upon events, but is simply the knowledge which God has of his own eternal purpose. So let's break this down and show the errors of the statement. According to the scriptural conception, God foreknows because he has foreordained all things. That's not true. God foreknows because he is God and he is omniscient and knows all things. God, okay, we can flip a coin right now, heads or tails, we flip that thing and God will know which side's going to land up, even though we don't know, but he's not making the side that he knows land up to land up. Does that make sense? You say, well, how could God possibly know that? Okay, here's a clue. He's God. You say, well, I can't understand that. Good. You shouldn't be able to understand God. That's why he's God and you're a people person, right? You're, you're, you're a human being that doesn't... My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are above your thoughts, saith the Lord of hosts. We can't understand God. And if you want to try to start understanding foreknowledge and predestination you're going to have a really hard time understanding where it could have come from. But this statement, God foreknows because he is foreordained, what that means is God knows what's going to happen. Okay, let's do this. Let's say uh, I give Rick, a, or I say, Rick, I'm going to flip this coin. Rick doesn't know it, but it's a two-headed coin. I know it. 
he doesn't know it. So I, I say, uh, I'm going to call it heads, Rick. Here we go. Flip. Oh, look at there, Rick. Heads it is. And uh, he's going to go, man, that's too bad. I really thought it was going to be tails. I foreknew it was going to be heads because I made a two-headed coin, the coin to be flipped. That's what this man is saying God does. God knows who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved because he handpicks who will be saved and who won't be saved. That's what he's saying. Does that make sense to you? I mean, it, it should make sense without making sense, right? <clears throat> and because in his providence, he will certainly bring all the past. That means in his power, he will bring all the things that he's foreordained to have happen, happen. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm trying to, to stick together here. His foreknowledge is not a dependent one, which just waits upon events. And I can agree with that statement. God, because if you have to wait for an event to happen, then it wasn't foreknowledge. If you go, if you go flip the coin, oh, it's heads. Oh, I knew it was going to be heads. Well, that's really easy to say, isn't it? Uh, I knew they were going to win that election. Well, it's easy to say after they did. Uh, anyways, I knew those were going to be the Powerball numbers. You know what? I think if you truly knew they were, you would have bought a ticket. But you didn't because you didn't truly know. Anyway, <clears throat> God's foreknowledge, number two. Uh, this, is, uh, this is under B. Uh, yeah, you don't have a fill in here. God's foreknowledge is not based upon his foreordination of things, but rather on his own omniscience. Now, this is my statement, a statement of truth. All right? God's foreknowledge is not based upon his foreordination of things, but rather on his omniscience. Meaning, God knows what's going to happen before it happens, not because he set it up to happen that way, but because he's an all-knowing God. Does that make sense? Good. Now, certainly, he does indeed foreknow all those things that he did predestinate, but his foreknowledge is not limited to his predestination. For instance, God knew that he would foreordain David to be the successor of Saul. And he set it up that way. So in that instance, his foreknowledge is tied to his predestination. But not everything that he foreknows did he predestinate. Or choose ahead of time to have happen. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Let me do it again. All right. So there are things that God foreknows because he's planned that they'll happen a certain way. Then there are other things that he foreknows not because he planned for them to happen that way. But because of his omniscience he knows that it's going to happen that way. For instance... God foreknew that the word of God would be preserved unto this generation and be preached in this city. He foreknew that and predestinated it. But your acceptance of the gospel when you heard it preached, he foreknew that you'd get saved, but not because he forced you to get saved, because his omniscience Helps him know, helps him. That's not even right. It gets pretty theologically muddy when you start talking about the incapabilities of God because he has none. You understand? We try to explain an eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent God in terms that human beings can comprehend. And it's impossible to do that. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, good. So that's, that explains my struggle in teaching and your struggle in understanding. How about that? So here's what foreknowledge is. And, and I, th I think we've expressed this. To foreknow, okay, uh, those of you who have been married a long time, you know your spouse really well, right? And you, you'll even do something to push their buttons. How do we know how to push our spouse's buttons? Because we foreknow how they're going to respond. And so we know that doing something or saying something means this is going to happen, right? Uh, I kiss Shannon on the neck. 
I know what's coming after that, right? More neck kisses is what's happening there. And so I foreknew her response. And so I can go that route. Amen. Let's pray and go home, shall we? Uh, <laughs> it's getting PG in here all of a sudden. So I, that's, we, we know each other. We push each other's buttons. to See, I know you're thinking, I push her buttons. She gets mad at me. Well, stop pushing the wrong buttons, man. <laughs> they all got a set of wrong buttons and all got a set of right buttons. Figure them out and push the right ones. Anyway, now all of a sudden we're at a couple's retreat, aren't we? <clears throat> so... To foreknow means to know how something is going to turn out. To predestinate is to see to it that something comes out that way. All right, let's say that you're, you pay your bills automatically through your bank's online payment system. You say, okay, this bill is due on October 12th, so I'm going to set it up for the payment to be received by October the 12th by my creditor. You just predestinated that to happen. And you don't even have to do anything on the 12th, do you? It's going to happen automatically. And you knew that bill was going to get paid on that date because you made it happen that way. On the other hand, if you sit down and write a check and you put it in the mailbox, you don't really know when it's going to get there. Uh, and I'm not saying God's that way because God in his foreknowledge will know when that check would arrive. What I'm saying is you want to put it on human terms we can predestinate something by making sure that it's going to happen at a certain point in time by setting it up ahead of schedule. That's what predestination is, determining before the destiny or outcome of a certain situation. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Letter C. The fact that some are not saved must prove that God did not want all men to be saved. This is a false statement, by the way. These letters A, B, and C are the Calvinist position, and they're all false. The fact that some are not saved must prove that God did not want all men to be saved. So let me take you through this, this, this logic that they have, all right? First, God is sovereign. He must always attain what he desires, his foreknowledge means he's predestinated every outcome. So if God already has arranged what he wants and he always gets what he wants, then if some people don't get saved, that must be what he wants. That makes sense? I, I mean, I, the logic of it, not <laughs> that that's the outcome. If man is unable to save himself on account of the fall of, of Adam... Uh, being a total fall, and if God alone can save, and if all are not saved, the conclusion must be that God is not chosen to save all. That's a quote from W.J. Seaton in the Five Points of Calvinism, page 7 and 8. Let me read it again to you. If man is unable to save himself on account of the fall in Adam being a total fall, and if God alone can save, and if all are not saved, the conclusion must be that God has not chosen to save all. See, unconditional election has to be tied in to total depravity. If you don't have total depravity, unconditional election doesn't make sense. Man has to be incapable of saying yes to the gospel in order for unconditional election to make sense. Are you following me? Good. Uh, so here's, here's the thing. If God takes away from me all personal will, and then he's completely sovereign and always gets his way, and I end up going to hell, he wanted me in hell. Because he didn't give me a will or the ability to say yes to the gospel. And since he always gets his way, if I'm in hell, he wants me there. This is the logic that they follow in order to explain their position. This is, the only, uh, this is only the conclusion reached if one follows the total depravity of man being the inability of man to choose Christ. So if you take away total depravity, unconditional election cannot exist. 
If man does have the choice to say yes or no to the gospel, then God cannot, if you will, select who will be saved and who will not be saved. It's left up to man, which incidentally is the case. It's left up to man. And that doesn't hinder God's sovereignty at all. Okay, here it is. Uh, Shannon and I, were grown adults. We have two grown adult children. We have a will for our children. We have a will that they be in church tonight. They're here. So they're fulfilling mom and dad's will for their life tonight. Now, we uh, have rule and influence in their life. But they could have also just as easily chosen not to be here tonight. That doesn't mean that, that I don't have influence in their life and that I don't have control over my own house. It means they have a free will. I shouldn't have told them that. They're packing up their things already and leaving. But uh, they have a free will that they can exercise on their own, you see. So let's now look at the biblical position. What does the Bible say? That's what the Calvinist says. The Calvinist says that God in his foreknowledge has predestinated certain to go to heaven and certain to go to hell, and it's unconditional. They don't get a choice in the matter. What is the biblical position? Now, letter Roman numeral two, the biblical position, I give you a statement, and then those other blanks are for the scripture references, okay? These are a little different than you're used to seeing. <clears throat> so letter A, God is sovereign and does what he wishes. God is sovereign, S-O-V-E-R-E-I-G-N, and does what he wishes. Now let me read you two verses, Psalms 115 and verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. That's pretty clear, isn't it? You know, the, the best book to shed light on the Bible is the Bible. You should read the Bible more than you read any religious books. Psalm 135 and verse 6. Psalm 135, verse 6. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. So there's two verses right there that tell us specifically God does whatever he wants to do. God is sovereign and does what he wishes. Letter B, but God does not always force his will on man. God does not always force his will on man. And for the record, sometimes God does. You ever read the ten plagues in Exodus? Some of them say, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then there are others that say, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So sometimes God does exert his will on man. Luke 13, 34. Luke 13, 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. God said, Jerusalem, there's a time I wanted to gather you together and protect you, but you wouldn't let me? Well, that's an attack on the sovereignty of God. Well, you'll have to take it up with the Son of God then because he's the one who said it. Huh? See, the rebellion of man doesn't affect the sovereignty of God. Look. I play a weird, twisted game sometimes in the summer. I'll walk down the sidewalk, and I'll see a big old ant walking down the sidewalk, and I, I start to play God with that ant. And I tell it, whether or not you live in the next 10 seconds, ant is up to me and me entirely. I have a choice right now. I can stomp on you and squish you out, and today was your last day. You got up and said goodbye to your aunt wife and kissed her. And you said goodbye to your little aunt children and kissed them. And you had no idea when you were going out to work today that some mean old preacher is going to step on you and squash you on the sidewalk. Or, in my abundant mercy for the aunt community, I can allow you to live and let you go. 
I'm sovereign in the life of that ant. But I don't always step on it. Always. Sometimes I do. Uh, even God's wrath will be shown someday, right? So here God's saying, look, I wanted to gather you together, but you wouldn't cooperate with me. Could God have forced them to gather? Yep. That's his sovereignty. Did he force them to? No. That's him allowing them free will. <clears throat> John chapter 5, verse 40. And this is becoming our go-to verse, isn't it? And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Does God want them to have life? Yes. In his sovereignty, could he force them to accept life? Yes. Does he? No. He gives them the choice. He does not always force his will on man. Let her see. God gives man choices which bring with them consequences. God gives men choices which bring with them consequences. With the choices, I mean. So let's read Jeremiah 18, 6 through 10. Jeremiah 18, verse 6 through 10. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instance I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instance I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. God says, here's A and B. If you choose A, I will do this. If you choose B, I will do this. You choose. The Calvinists would say, no, no such agreement is ever made in the word of God. People that believe these heretical doctrines are truly blind to much of what the Bible teaches. How about this one? You know this one well. 2 Chronicles 7.14 If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. See, these if-then scenarios, if the Calvinists were right, there'd be none of them. Uh, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the godly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which bringeth forth its fruit in his season. So these, these if you do this, I'll do this. If, if the sovereignty of God is so ironclad that God forces everyone to do everything, then those things don't matter. But what a Calvinist will say is, oh no, they're all still true. The thing is, though, that God has already decided who would obey him and who would not. What's the point of obedience if it's forced? You know, you got a prison guard who's, you know, pushing a guy into his cell and sliding it locked. Uh... You know, and, and the prisoner walks willingly through the gates because the, the guard, you know, has the ability to make life really, really bad for that prisoner. Could Does that guard say, boy, those guys that I guard, honey, they sure do love and respect me. <laughs> no, they do what you tell them to do because they have no other choice. He doesn't go home feeling all warm and fuzzy about the way his prisoners respond to his direction. He knows they're only doing In fact, you let that prisoner get a hold of something to hurt that guard and what's going to happen? Mark eleven twenty six. This is the final verse under letter C. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So God says, if you forgive, I'll forgive. If you don't forgive, I won't forgive. Letter D, God offers salvation to all men. So this matter of some are elect to hell and some are elect to heaven is not true. Can you prove that in the Bible? Yeah, let's do it. 1 John 2.2, 2. 
And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, if you show that to a Calvinist, here's our response. He means the whole world that's elect. That's what they'll tell you. That's their answer to everything. Any of these verses that claim the totality of mankind, no, no, you misunderstand that. It only means the totality of the elect as predestined by the foreknowledge of God. If you sat down as a new Christian and started reading the Bible and you read it for 20 years, you'd never come up with Calvinism. <clears throat> Nowhere does the Bible teach that God wills for some people to go to heaven and some to go to hell. The Bible teaches that God would have all men to be saved. 2 Peter 3.9, this is your next verse under letter D. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. I like this verse. But is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Can it be clearer? <laughs> Peter even says there's not even room for any slack in this. God is not willing. You want to talk sovereignty of God? Let's talk sovereignty of God. God's not willing that any should perish. That's the sovereignty of God. But that all should come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2.4 1 Timothy 2.4 Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. We do this once in a while, don't we? The word all in the Greek means all. all. God does not, these are your final blanks, God does not unconditionally elect some to heaven and some to hell. He does not. There is a condition. What is the condition? Whether or not someone accepts Christ as Savior. Unconditional election. There's no condition under which man could be saved of his own volition. That's wrong. Man has the choice to say yes or no to Christ. See, here's King Agrippa is being spoken to by Paul. And Paul says, King, you know what the prophets have said, and you believe the prophets, and you know the ways of us Jews. And Agrippa says, almost persuadest thou me to be a Christian. The Calvinists would say, see, he wasn't one of the elector. He would have. That's what they say. If he was an elect, he would have said, you persuade me to be a Christian. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This in no way steps upon the foreknowledge or sovereignty of God. God in his will does not control everything. And man, I'll tell you what, these sovereignty guys will call me a heretic for making such a statement. God, in his will, does not control everything. So you're driving down the road in your car, you don't see it, you don't know it, but there's a, a roofing nail standing right up on its head in the lane, and your tire's about to go over it. And sure enough, poof. It punctures your tire, and within a half a mile, you're like, this isn't steering right anymore. You pull over, tire's flat. The Calvinist says, hmm, for some reason, God chose to put that nail in the road right where my tire was getting ready to run over it. In fact, it wasn't there, the car in front of me, and all of a sudden, it is there for me. God, in his foreknowledge, did predestinate that nail to be put in the lane so that I could run over it. Now, the truth of the matter is, that could be true. Or it could also be true that some knucklehead kicked over the nail bucket and one nail rolled out onto the edge of the bed of the truck and when they hit the pothole, it fell out just then and that's when your tire ran over it. Let me give you a verse, Ecclesiastes 9.11. 
Solomon says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. You know, some things don't happen in your life because God forced it to happen. Sometimes it's time and chance. I mean, you know, we got to go down this whole road, sort of. So you're telling me that every serial killer that takes a life, God foreordained that? Of course not. The, the sinfulness of man. Now, has God used the sinfulness of man? Sure. Nebuchadnezzar, go enslave my people. In fact, I heard a man preach a sermon recently uh, that, I don't know if I should tell you, maybe I'll steal it and preach it and you'll think I'm brilliant. Um... You probably won't. You've listened to me too long to know that. <clears throat> he, he, he says, the Lord borrowed the hand of judgment against Israel. Or he, he borrowed an ax, something like that. And, uh, and, and, and the truth of the message the preacher was preaching was, God doesn't even own his own ax. If he's going to use an ax against his people, he has to go borrow one. And so he borrowed Nebuchadnezzar's ax. That's a good truth. Uh, my point is, is simply th that God can use his sovereignty to direct people, but he doesn't every time. He doesn't all the time. God allows all things that happen to happen, but he doesn't make all things happen. And therein is the sovereignty of God, the fact that he allows it to happen. Some things occur because of the actions of man. So let's finish with this. Then how does God's foreknowledge and election work together? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. I should have had you turning to all these. How many of you have been turning to all these references? Ah, uh, nobody. Nobody. Rats. In my foreknowledge, I knew you weren't going to turn to any of these. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me get you to look at least one verse. I could be lying to you all the way through this. You got to... Oh, I'm going to check him when we get home. How many believe Brent that he's going to check him when he gets home? Yeah, same number of hands. Oh, come on. Yeah, yeah, you guys are in cahoots. I'm, I'm not fooled. Nicole? Brilliant idea. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 1. Are you there? Verse number 2. Read the first statement with me together. Ready? Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So how does election and foreknowledge work together? We are elect according to his foreknowledge. Because there is the elect. If you're saved, you're part of the elect. A lost person is not a part of the elect. Then how, well, how, do, how, how, how are the elect chosen? The elect choose Christ and that makes them elect. How are they made elect by God according to his foreknowledge? God knew in eternity past that you would say yes to Christ. And so you're a part of the elect. You can't separate election from foreknowledge. The Calvinists try to tie election with predestination. That doesn't work. You don't find those two things together. You find foreknowledge and election together. It's like saying, okay, here we go. Uh, Brent and I, we're going to have the uh, fall harvest party. We're going to play kickball in the parking lot. Uh, here are the people who are going to be there. And so uh, Brent chooses his team up and I choose my team up. And then when the people all show up, they're already on the team. How did we know which team to put them on? Because we knew that they were going to show up for the kickball game. And so we pre-selected them based on our knowing they were coming. God elects you based on his knowledge that you would one day say yes to Jesus. Does that make sense? Good. Because I can't keep doing this. Election is based on God's foreknowledge of who will trust Christ. He knows those who will, and those are the elect. Anything other than that would make God unjust and a respecter of persons. Saying, oh, uh, let's see, I, that last blank, what is it? 
Election is based on God's foreknowledge of who will trust Christ. Anything other than that would make God unjust and a respecter of persons. Saying that God has already predetermined who will be saved and who will not makes soul winning and evangelism useless. <clears throat> if those who are going to be saved are going to be saved no matter what we do, man, let's sell these buses, take the money, and do something different with it. Let's quit getting up early on Sunday mornings in the winter time and trying to drag kids out of a warm bed. Let's just, you know, let's shut down the Sunday school. There's no point in any of it if it's already predetermined. But it's not already predetermined. That's why Christ said, go preach the gospel. Compel them. Agrippa said, almost persuadest thou me. See, that's our job. Our job is persuading and compelling people to say yes to Jesus Christ. If election were true, God would say, why are you working so hard to persuade and compel people? They're going to get saved anyway. I already knew that. And the ones that aren't, they're not, no matter what you say. Does that make sense? I mean, okay. I have to, that's a weird question to ask when you're talking about heresy. Does the heresy make sense? I mean, no. Yes, it makes sense what they believe, but no, it's ridiculous compared to the Bible. So, all right, that's unconditional election. Total depravity of man, unconditional election. Very good. Ushers, come on down. Let's receive our offering at this time. Please be faithful and generous in your giving. Uh, I forget, we are at uh, about $3,000 this week, I think, is what we've seen come in so far. Uh, please continue to give generously. Help us make these bills. We got bills to pay. All right, Dad, would you please pray for this offering? Amen. While they collect, I'll give you these announcements. Uh, the prayer emphasis is for the Cape family coming to be with us this weekend. Beginners Bible reading, Psalm 101 to 125. Advanced readers, uh, the book of John and the book of Acts. 92, 93 people saved actually so far year to date. 33 have been baptized. Uh, then let me give you the schedule here through the weekend. Tomorrow night, Soul winning bus, 6.30 p.m., and we're done by 7.30 p.m. Pardon me, one hour. Bring good walking shoes. We're going back where we were last week again. Then Friday night, midnight prayer meeting, 11 p.m. to midnight. Then Saturday morning, the capes will be with us, Lord willing, uh, and we will begin the morning downstairs in the fellowship hall with our 9 a.m. prayer time over our 10 items, midnight at the bakery. As soon as our prayer time is done, we will have a continental breakfast down there. And then come 9.30, we'll start here in the auditorium promptly. Uh, from 9.30 to noon, Brother Cape has four sessions for us. They're about 30-minute sessions each, and we will be breaking for intermissions in between each one so that you can use the restroom, get up and stretch, and move around if you need to. The sessions that he's going to be teaching are, are these. How can I face tomorrow when I cannot get past today? Making decisions when you're not sure of the outcome. When miracles come one step at a time. And how to keep your spirit healthy when you or your loved one's health isn't. I encourage you, if you're not doing anything Saturday morning already, you're not working or whatnot, Come and be a part of the morning. These things will help you. We're going to show different clips of the documentary. We don't show the whole thing. He does things a little differently now. But Saturday morning, 9 a.m. to noon, those three hours, we'll start with prayer and, and refreshments and go right into the sessions. Uh, if you know people that are struggling, that are discouraged, defeated, get them here for these sessions. Then also, Sunday, uh, Sunday, they'll be with us all day long. Sunday school, our adult classes and teen classes will be in the auditorium. Brother Cape will be teaching. And then Sunday morning and night, Brother Cape will be preaching. Uh, Mrs. Cape and Heather will be here. And the family will be singing for us as well. So you're going to want to be a part of this weekend and get as many people here as you can. Folks, when I'm inviting them and telling them about it, I mean, be excited about it. Uh, tell them that, hey, 
hey, Sunday in our church, we're going to have a young lady there. Uh, the doctors have surgically removed half of her brain, and her parents are coming with her to tell her story and tell how they made it through all of these challenges. And uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get some good response. I, I mentioned to our teachers, I invited someone that I wasn't sure I'd ever be able to get to church and received my invitation very, very well. And then I even discussed something else with him, and as I was leaving, he said, hey, I might be seeing you on Sunday. And he said it pretty matter-of-factly. So just invite everyone you can. It'll help them, I promise you. Then, uh, bus routes, don't forget we're having pizza on Sundays. Prom on Sunday, promote that to your uh, riders, Sunday school teachers, as you visit your absentees and others, make sure that you promote that as well. All right, I'm going to stop there. That's enough announcements. we got a lot going on. Somebody said we're a busy church, and it's starting to look like it a little bit, isn't it? All right, yes. No, next Friday. Yes, sir. Yep, the 7th. Yep. Nick? Yeah, that's for Fall Harvest Party. I'll announce it Sunday. I'm just trying to keep it short. I'm truly trying to make this new prayer shift and make it look like it's making a difference, and you're really hindering that. Terry? Is the hall, at the Fall Harvest Party, is that a group of people, is somebody, or my grandkids, is that take $10? Uh, what do we charge, $5, or do we charge $10? Yeah, we charge $5. And, you know, itty-bitties don't have to pay anything. But once a kid starts putting the food away, yeah, I, I, I know. Yeah, your boys, we need to, they all need to pay. All right, is that it? Good. Okay, it's only 7.52. How about that? You're dismissed. I'll confess that later.